Mark chapter 13. How many of you guys uh, started your Bible reading plan, any kind of Bible reading plan this year? Awesome, several of you. I tell you, that Navigator's plan, I'm really enjoying because there's, it takes little sections from multiple places, and I like the variety, so I'm very excited about uh, sticking with that. I, I definitely got into it this week, so um, if, it's, if that's not the plan for you, I pray that you do have some type of Bible reading plan. Uh, even if just one chapter of the New Testament a day, I just pray that that, that is a, a habit uh, that you have, prayerfully reading God's Word. So, uh, Last week we came as far as verse 13, and we're going to be getting into uh, this Olivet Discourse, Mark chapter 13, as we continue along, and it is the Olivet Discourse, and it reminds us uh, that Time is in God's hands. The clock is ticking. And I love that this has lined up with this first Sunday of this year, uh, the way that this message is lined up. But you and I as finite beings, everything about us is boxed in by time. You know, God stands outside of time. God is the uncreated one. He is the uh, first cause cause or the uncaused cause, as Aristotle would say. He is the uh, who always was always is and who is to come on Wednesday night we looked at the book of Revelation chapter 1 and we saw some of these names of Jesus I mean the first and the last the Alpha the Omega the beginning and the end Jesus holds time in his hands that's what David would write about himself my time is in your hands you know and it's not a coincidence that you are born the year, the day that you were born, that you live where you live. You know, God is in control and time is in his hands from creation to consummation. There was a time that, you know, there was an hour that God breathed breath into the lungs of Adam. And there's an hour that's coming. The Bible reveals that Jesus will return. The Bible is very clear about that and about the future, that there is the hour. No one knows the hour except for the Father. It's a picture of a Jewish wedding. You know, in a Jewish wedding, the uh, bride uh, would be waiting, unexpectedly, they didn't know when. The bride wouldn't know when the groom was gonna return. And that's the picture, is that the Father, once the house is ready, he says to the Son, go get your bride. And we don't know, not even the Son knows until the time that the Father is Someday soon, going to say, now is the time, the hour has come. You know, that's one of the key verses in Mark chapter 13. If you want to look down at verse 32, or it's on the screen, this is sort of a key, couple of key thoughts and verses. Jesus said, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then he says some specific words, some specific application. He says, be on your guard and keep awake. Be awake. Don't be spiritually asleep. You know, this is a good thing to think about, especially in the new year. You know, what if this was the year? What if Christ came back this year? What if it was like, you know, November 3rd or you know, May 2nd? We just don't know. What if, it, what if this was the year? Maranatha, I pray it is. Lord, come. Jesus, Lord, come, please. You know, in this Olivet Discourse, we're challenged with this. We're given some of the details about the future. But the question is, what will he find you doing? If Jesus came back today, what would you be doing? Would you be on guard? Would you be awake? Would you be doing things with meaning, with eternal significance and value? You know, this discourse... The Olivet Discourse has a lot of prophecy, and that may seem very weird. If, if somebody just invited you to church, and this is the first time you've ever been to church, this is going to sound, some of it's going to be really strange. You're like, what in the, what are they talking about, the future? You know the future? Like, I mean, there are some things about the future that the Bible reveals, and the more that you get to know God, the more that you get to know your Bible, that is the hope. Jesus is our hope. And the more that we are suffering, the more we appreciate it. We want Jesus to return. A lot of times, you know, people 
sort of exploit the idea. You see a lot of weirdos on YouTube that are just like talking about, you know, the end times all the time and, you know, sort of making a buck off of it. But that's not what we want to do. We want to be faithful to the word. We want to go through the word verse by verse. And the Bible reveals much prophecy, much to do with the future. Some of this prophecy in Mark 13 was fulfilled in 70 AD. We saw some of that last week. The temple, for example, was destroyed. But several things here, speaking of the tribulation and the second coming of Christ, have not been fulfilled yet. So let's go to verse 14 and we'll go verse by verse. I'm going to say a lot more probably about verse 14 than some other verses. Mark chapter 13, verse 14 says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be let the reader understand then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains so this Olivet Discourse is in all three of the synoptic gospels Mark uh, Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 21 there's something else that Matthew includes on this and I have it on the screen there's two other details about this abomination of desolation in verse 15 of Matthew 24 it says so when you see the abomination of desolation notice he says spoken of by the prophet Daniel and he also includes standing in the holy place let the reader understand then those who are in Judea flee uh, to the mountains so what is this abomination of desolation you know I was honestly confused about this first time I I remember hearing this, I'm like, what in the world? And I think I dozed off for a minute and, you know, missed it. You know, it's like, I want to tell you very plainly, this abomination of desolation is a moment in the future, Revelation 13, where the Antichrist rises on the scene and claims himself to be God in the temple. It's an abomination that brings desolation. There's several reasons why we know that. This abomination of desolation is mentioned five times, twice in the book of Daniel, three other times in the synoptics, and it's also alluded to in Thessalonians and then also Revelation 13. Daniel 9.27 refers to this, and most people thought this was fulfilled by a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. He called himself Epiphanes, Antiochus. You know, Antiochus set up a statue of Zeus in the temple in 167 B.C. And not only that, when he set up this temple, he sacrificed a pig on the altar. That was an abomination, and it brought desolation. Most people thought, okay, that was the prophecy of Daniel, and it was fulfilled. But here Jesus comes on the scene, and much later than 167, right? And he says the same thing. When you see this abomination of desolation... There's chaos going to be happening. And he alludes to the great tribulation. And he uses the word tribulation multiple times. The preterist view would say that this abomination happened in 70 AD, that it was Titus, one of the rulers of the Roman army that uh, was involved in the Jewish war and the destruction of the temple. But he never entered the temple. Uh, it's, tradition says probably a Roman soldier or somebody threw uh, a torch or something in the temple and the temple caught fire, but there was no abomination that happened. This is still yet future. Uh, Second Thessalonians, Paul mentions and alludes to this. He doesn't use these exact words, but you could write it down or notice Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 3, he says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day, meaning the last days, the end of all things, the, the string of events, the day of the Lord, that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, that is the great apostasy, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Man of lawlessness is another name for the Antichrist. John is the one who called him Antichrist only once in the Bible. He's also the beast in Revelation 13. So it's not going to come until this man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, and here it alludes to this abomination, who opposes himself and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship 
so that he takes his seat in the temple, blasphemous act, proclaiming himself to be God. And he says, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things, and you know what is restraining him. I think that's the Holy Spirit through believers. We are helping restrain evil in a sense. Restraining him now that we, uh, so that he may be revealed in his time, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. We see it around us. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is taken out of the way. So Revelation 13 speaks of this beast, this world leader. Um, you know, it also alludes here to a temple being rebuilt. Which is very interesting. When you go to Jerusalem today, and there's, the Jerusalem is divided into four quarters. In the Jerusalem quarter, there is an organization right now called the Temple Institute that is ready to rebuild the temple at any time. You know, it's not a popular thing, especially amongst Muslims who control the Temple Mount at the moment. But they have a full-size menorah. They have training of the priesthood. They have, they're ready to go with sacrifices. I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm not saying it's necessary. Jesus paid the price. Jesus sacrificed himself once and for all. It doesn't mean it's right, but it's happening. There is some type of temple that's going to be rebuilt before the end times. It doesn't mean Jesus couldn't come back today. You know, they could certainly rebuild the temple very quickly within this first three and a half years before this happens. From Daniel chapter 9, we know that there is the seven-year period of great tribulation that's coming upon the earth. I think the rapture is going to happen first. We'll hit on that in a minute. Look at verse 15, back in Mark. Let the one who's in the house, on the housetop, not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. Uh, And let the one who's in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Matthew includes, one will be taken, another left. And alas, for women who are pregnant... uh, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, I think this is during the tribulation, pray that it not may, ha- may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation, and that God created until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short those days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, and look, there he is, don't believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise. You can read about this also in Revelation 13. They will be false prophets that arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. And then he says specifically to disciples, be on your guard, but be on your guard. Before I have told you these things beforehand. So what Jesus is describing here is this period of time that we would call the Great Tribulation. It's also called the time of Jacob's trouble or the 70th week of Daniel. We don't have time to go into all those things, but it's a seven-year period. Even Revelation includes specific numbers, 42 months after this beast rises on the scene. And there is great chaos, there is great... Uh, disease, intense heat, drought, hail, the seven seals that are open, the blasts of the trumpets, the plagues. It'll be especially hard for people who are alive during this time. And as a reminder, I think that you and I as believers, if you're here and you're a believer this morning, I think the Bible is very clear that there will be what is called the rapture of the church. It's mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 5. It, the word rapture comes from the Latin translation of har, harpazo will be taken away. It's very clear throughout Scripture God always delivers his people, whether it was the ark. God said to Noah, build an ark. He's going to pour out his wrath upon the earth. He builds an ark. He saves the righteous. God has not appointed us to suffer wrath. He's going to take us away. I think we'll be, if you're a believer in Jesus, you're born again, I think we'll be at a wedding in heaven wedding supper of the lamb but it's a distinct event but clearly there are believers it's probably people who when the rapture happens that's when their eyes are opened they're like wait a minute the gospel is real the bible is real and there's people clearly who are saved it talks about the elect on the earth during this tribulation Probably a lot of mostly Jews, God's elect, who turn to faith in Jesus. 
But there are people who are saved, opened up to the gospel. Listen, during this tribulation, you know, it's going to be so bad. There's this leader, uh, one of the signs we've mentioned, you won't even be able to go to Publix and buy potato salad without having his mark on your hand. Right? That's sort of what Revelation also reveals about the future. And we're seeing that. We're seeing how easy that is. Like, I mean, that was happening during COVID. Everybody's like, is this the, you know, are we in the tribulation? You have to have a passport to go to the gym? Like, are you serious? That's why people were like, all these wild theories. But we can see all around us how we could have one currency, one leader, one ruler. Never before has it seemed even possible. You can read about all this, especially in Revelation. We're going through that on Wednesday nights right now, but Jesus continues talking about the tribulation here, verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from the heavens, from heaven. The powers in the heavens will be shaken, and here is our hope. Listen. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heaven. So after the seven-year period of, tri- uh, uh, of tribulation is the second coming of Christ. Listen, it is a distinct event from the rapture of the church. There's some brothers and sisters among us that may have a different view of that, that it happens it, you know, but all at the end of the tribulation. I don't know why anybody would want that to happen. You know, like, we want to be raptured. Trust me, you want, you want the rapture to be right. But it's a distinct event, the second coming of Christ. Daniel mentions this, one like a son of man coming on the clouds. Revelation uh, 19, here, let's read this. It's beautiful, like this beautiful picture of Jesus coming in. Revelation 19 John writes, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, the blood shed on the cross, right, and he's, by which we are forgiven of sins. In the, The name by which he is called is the Word of God. And that's a name for Jesus, the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen. I think this is believers, us, coming back with Christ. Arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. That alludes to the prophecy in, in Psalm 2. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has the name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Another beautiful name for Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We won't read it right there, but right after that is the battle of Armageddon. Jesus defeats Satan with the word of his mouth. He locks him up for a thousand years. And ushers in the millennial reign. You know, Satan may get away with a little bit for a time being, but it won't last forever. Right? Jesus is our hope. And listen, it gets very practical. Get back to Mark 13 here. It's very practical. Notice. Verse 28. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as you, its branches become tender and puts out its, le- its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gate. So the signs are obvious that Jesus is coming soon. Verse 30. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So in the context of this, even the next verses, it has to be the generation that is alive during this time of tribulation. Verse 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. We keep everything in perspective. All, it puts everything in perspective. When This idea that heaven and earth, everything on heaven and earth will pass away, will be made new. But God's word is eternal. Verse 32, concerning the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, 
for you do not know when the time will come. So we're challenged here, again, not to be caught off guard, not to be spiritually asleep. And he illustrates it again, very practical. He says, it's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, we are servants of Christ with the work to do in the meantime, each with his work, commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. I mean, how many times is he saying it this morning? Stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you don't know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. You think Jesus as a message for the new year for us, right? Wake up. Be awake. Don't be spiritually asleep. There are three challenges here I have, I think the Lord has for us as a church this morning in this new year. Three challenges. One is very specifically, be on guard and stay spiritually awake. He's obviously said it multiple times. You know, a lot of times it's illustrated by what we would call a watchman. You know, we see this in the Old Testament. It's sort of a primitive type of security guard in a sense. A watchman is someone who would be standing guard over a community or a city so that they are awake during the watches of the night. If an enemy were to come, were to come he would be able to wake others up and protect the city or the community. You and I are to be like watchmen, not sleeping and letting our guard down spiritually. We're to be awake. You know, what does that even mean practically for us? I mean, the person spiritually asleep is one who's just living it up, partying, getting wasted, drunk, you know, living only for the pleasures of this world. No restraint over the flesh or sin, just indulging in, you know, whatever their heart desires, their wretched heart desires, paying no attention to God, not reading the Bible, not praying. That's sort of what it means to be spiritually asleep. A person who's spiritually awake, very practically speaking, is someone who's in the Word, I would say on a daily basis, praying, right? Having a relationship with Jesus, fighting sin, repenting of sin quickly, when you fail, when you mess up, being the church, right? Like using your spiritual gifts, showing up even when you don't feel like it, encouraging one another, encourage one another daily, being the community, fighting sin, witnessing, doing the work of righteousness, right? Like working in your, uh, your profession, your business, whatever it is, not being someone lying, stealing, cheating, but being the restraining force of evil, right? The salt of the earth. That's what it means to be spiritually awake, sharing your faith, being a light to the world. So are you spiritually awake? Have you fallen asleep in 2023? Like, are you far from God? Like, wake up, right? Like, you know, it's not the time to be, you know, I love live stream. I'm thankful if you're sick, stay home. But if it's because you just don't want to put your pants on, like, get up, like, wake up and get to church. Like, be the church, right? Like, I understand if you're sick, don't come, stay home. If you're out of town, thank, you know, we have a lot of people around the nation, world, who watch our, our sermons or whatever, but it's not, you know, that's not the church. We be the church. We, we come together. We're the priesthood of believers. Get back to the things you did at first. Christ is coming back soon. Imagine if Christ came back and you... You know, we're just completely caught off guard. There's a work for you to do, specific things that God has prepared in advance for you to do. So Ephesians 2.10 says that you, every one of you, are God's masterpiece, and he has good works prepared in advance for you to do. 2023 needs to be a year of meaning, right? Doing the work that he's called you to do. Not meaningless partying, chasing after money. Chasing after money is chasing after the wind. It's meaningless. Partying, pleasure, food, and drink. God has called us to live to so much, for so much more, not to just waste 
our lives. The things that have eternal significance and value is the work of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean you know, don't work your jobs, but have the right perspective. And that's the second idea this morning. Number two, keep the right perspective on material things. You know, it's pretty cliche, I understand, but you know, like, you've heard these people say, well, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? Like, naked we came from our mother's womb, naked we're going to return. Like, the things of this world, the material things, they have their place, they have their purpose. But the things of this world, we should not be engrossed in them. That's what Corinthians says, Paul writes, you know, this, present, this world in its present form is passing away. So we use the things of the world as like we're just stewards, we're just passing through, we're just pilgrims. We're not, this isn't our home, we are living in tents, this is a tent. It's not a permanent brick and mortar facility like that we're setting up for eternal life here. Eternal life is in heaven. Material things of this world, the, the jobs that we have, they're a means for eternal things. You know, there are very few things that are eternal. You know, this, this is eternal. The Bible is eternal. So he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, my word will endure forever. God is eternal. You know what else? Is, you know who else is eternal? You know what else? I just gave it away. People. People are eternal. You are. Your, your family, your friends. That's what truly matters. Relationships with people, not material things. That's not the things that truly matter in this life. Uh, we had such an amazing uh, money-wise class yesterday. It was a packed house over here. Some incredible wisdom from Jack and Tim and Steve. One of the things Tim said was, take a minute and think about your, the vision of money in 15 years. Like, what do, you, what do you wanna, where do you want that to be like, you know? And we sat there in silence thinking about it. And he's like, does anybody want to share? And one of the things Rosario had shared was like, I want to have more residual income so that I can give more time to serving the Lord. You know, and it's like, and they're just challenging us to pay off debt, right? Don't be enslaved to debt so that you can serve the Lord. What a beautiful class that was. But the idea is keep the right perspective on material things. We should have jobs, but jobs are only a means. They're not what we worship. Our relationships are not you know, what fulfill us. Our, the relationship with God fulfills us. You know, we make money, but we're not obsessed with money. Notice what Philippians says, Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to even subject all things to himself. Who's ready for a new body? Maybe some of the older people. Like, I know I am, yes. I'm looking forward to that day, right? Please, Lord. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. And then Matthew also says, don't lay up yourselves treasures in, on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store away treasures in heaven. And the third idea, the third challenge for us this morning is make the most of time, of your time, what time you have. The hour is at hand. Jesus said in Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, you guys know the last chapter, it's so beautiful, last chapter of the Bible. He says, behold, I am coming soon. Or look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What he's talking and alluding to here is what we would call the Bema Seat Judgment. Every believer, we're not going to stand before the great white throne judgment, we're going to stand before the Bema Seat Judgment. It's like this, you know, idea of the the. Greek Olympics, in a sense, we stand there and we're judged according to our Christian service. And we're rewarded based on how we've served the Lord. And I pray that all of us in this room, myself included, we hear from Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. That's the idea. You're going to waste your life, your time on meaningless things. Let 2024 be a year of meaning, eternal significance. Have, do things that matter. You know, the Bible is coming true right before our eyes. We see it. Be careful, the Bible says. Look at this. I love this verse so much. Ephesians 5. Look at this. Be very careful, then, how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are 
evil. Make the most of this year, not just living for material things, things that have no eternal significance. Now think of Solomon. He says, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. There are worldly things have no meaning, right? You know, great things are ahead. You know, if, I pray that this year is one that you are on guard spiritually. You know, if you are here this morning, maybe this, this, this is all just sounding nuts to you. Like, you're like, this is all new to me. And, you know, you, Jesus is your only hope. Jesus is your Savior. You can be made right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, in Revelation, Jesus also said, let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. Jesus paid the price so that salvation is a free gift to you, to you who believe. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If you're not right with God, if you... You know, if you're not sure if that trumpet blasts today, if you would be the one who's left, get right with God. Deal with your sins. Repent. So Peter said, repent and be baptized. Baptism doesn't save you. Baptism is the first step that you believe the gospel. So repent of your sins. Trust Christ as your Savior. Cry out to him for mercy. Be forgiven of your sins. And sign up for baptism. Make that, fresh, make that first commitment to Christ. You know, the band's going to come. I thought we would start the year with communion. Mike is in, and Daniel are coming. The ushers are going to come. And one of the things that Jesus said regarding communion, he says, do this in remembrance of me. And when we do this, we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Even in communion, it's a reminder of the second coming, the rapture of the church or the rapture of the church. So if you're a believer and you would like to partake in communion, maybe you just committed your life to Christ. This could be the first time. You don't have to get baptized first. If you believe and you've trusted Christ, we're going to partake in communion. Just hold, as it comes by, just hold on to the bread and the juice and examine your hearts for a minute. I'll repent if you need to, pray, spend time with the Lord. Let's think about the Lord. Grander earth has quakes before. Moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred. Be calmed and broken.
Yes, Lord, we thank you, God, that it is well with our soul. We know our soul is eternal and we're going to live forever. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we thank you for that hope. Thank you for the hope of the second coming, the rapture, Lord. We know that you have time in your hands, Lord, from beginning to end. You're the first, you're the last, the alpha, the omega. You're our savior, you're king of kings and lord of lords. As we uh, have this bread, this juice, we remember, Lord, the gospel. We remember the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Our only hope for salvation. Lord Jesus, we know that that sacrifice, your sacrifice, paid our debt in full. You took our place. You substituted yourself for us so that we could live forever. We thank you, Lord. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's share in the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's share in the cup together. For whenever you eat this bread... And drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The first church used to say Maranatha. Can we say, let's say that together. Maranatha. Yeah, on three. One, two, three. Maranatha. They used to greet one another. That means come Lord Jesus. So let's all stand together. We're going to sing one last chorus. Open up the heavens. Uh, let's, let's make this a prayer. Open up the heavens. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Hallelujah, Lord. Woo. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. If you need prayer for any reason, uh, I'm available. The elders are available. But may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace and joy as you walk with him this week. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys are dismissed.